my sequence of poems, uh, Rooms. And the rooms are a series of poems that situate themselves in specific historical or imagined interiors. In the past, I've spoken at length about my intentions, conceptually speaking, with this sequence in mind. But I realized, and finding myself in situations like this, that there was a great deal of falsity in that. So I'm just going to read them alongside the note that accompanies each poem, because the notes work as a sort of parallel text to the poems. So these poems are really more poems about interiors than exteriors, but hopefully they come together to form a sort of cohesive structure, an edifice of poems. Um. A Room in Paris, 1855. An alchemist's gas lamp reaches shakily into one corner. Some paintings nobody has a particular opinion on are nailed over rose ballroom wallpaper. And on the long bed, the middle-aged poet, Gerard de Naval. He would appear restful if it wasn't for his eyebrows meeting like two dark horses in the middle of his forehead. He is dreaming of the beautiful apple he palmed only a few days before on Ile Saint-Louis and the grief of a wormhole in the thing perfected. He wakes all of a sudden. He takes his collection Le Chimere down from its cramped shelf and cuts it in half at the spine with a knife. He will clean every sentence. And the corresponding note, um, Gerard de Naval, symbolist poet who died on the banks of the River Seine in the winter of 1855. The next room, um, a room at the Grand Hotel de Rochenois, 1971. Madame likes to air the double she takes for eight weeks on the sea-facing east wing. She's written 12 postcards to Brussels in a month. Her tone, la mer est jolie, is light and blasé, though she counts six instances of the word tineb. Arthritis has touched her best hand. Outside the sea, glances her way with distance, where once everything in the world was a man asking her to dance. On one shelf, in ribbons, her empty hat box deepens into deeper hat boxes that collapse slowly into the green pinnacle halls of the pinnacle men she knew. Madame dreams in the window chair and sees her postcards from the Roche Noir fly lightly down over the swathe of sea from the undercarriage of an albatross. The ocean bird migrating, but so everything seems at this point. The cad with a tall white grin throwing double sixes at midnight. Fresh oysters with their slight cologne in the back seats of young France. The concierge is calling her. Madame, Madame. An old albatross, the scuffed white of lobby magazines. An old albatross, but content as she wanders off the edge of the continent. And the corresponding note? <laughs> um, a room on the cap, oh no, sorry. <laughs> a room in the Grand Hotel de Rochenois, 1971. The Grand Hotel de Rochenois in Normandy, the hotel which can be translated as the Grand Hotel of the Black Rocks, was a glamorous hub for the gambling and sporting sets in the early part of the 20th century, falling into decline years later. Um. So, the next one is A Room in Taiwan, 2010. 
And how many desert miles of the web has she crossed tonight, searching for the home address of Mastroianni? Mastroianni is no longer among us. She doesn't know this, so continues her drift from one ruined domain to the next one, signing herself in to empty guess books as she goes. I would like to write to Mr. Marcello Mastroianni, please, if anyone know where he is. I dream us in light of stars and great city Rome. I want to be like Kiss of Anita Ekberg. Mastroianni, whose thousand pictures in these forums lose him on pages like palimpsests of man on top of man, where this girl at her tropical desk, who lists for his deep romantic heart, touches a hit counter once in the dark. A Room in Taiwan, 2010, Marcello Mastroianni, Italian actor, famous for his roles in Fellini's La Dolce Vita and Otto e Mezzo. Um, okay. uh, the next room is a room on the Capitan Paul Le Merle, 1941. Yesterday, a deckhand confused the new land with a cloud bank and its own flocks and shepherds and white houses in the clouds' country. The sea is green at night, a violent blue by day, and wider and deeper than the dreams of André Breton. André Breton is aboard the Capitan. He's writing to someone, 1 a.m. His bunk wobbles in the rough passage, and his gas lamp swings. On his wrists, the eczema has come up again. His yellow sleeve is spotted with ink, as he spills his hand across the page. He's writing to his wife, or to Nadja, but won't decide who until he signs off. He's describing the luminescence that rises through the ocean at night and follows the Capitan. First, there is only a pulse, the propeller turning up green sparks, stirring them with its long ladles before the lighted halls of plankton appear. It follows us, dearest, disappearing for days, then returning in waves like the mind to a place. In every light shoal, he sees something he remembers. In every hall, an empty lectern and shipment papers. André Breton walks a Sorbonne in his head and goes from room to room to look for the lights, they're flickering. He writes how the crew saw Amanta rise in the glow with its dark studies under one arm of its cloak, circle once, then wing slowly out of their surveillance. Um, a room on the Capitan Paul Le Merle, 1941. The Capitan Paul Le Merle was a transatlantic vessel that smuggled a number of intellectuals and artists out of a Vichy-controlled France in the 1940s. Among them were André Breton and Claude Lévi-Strauss. Um. Okay. Okay, so the next room is a room in Naples, 2005. <clears throat> Lo Spagnolo, unshaven, up in bed, on his last morning as a free man. Sunlight grids his face on one side as it enters through the shutters. An early sea mist lifts from the hits, his boys left at angles in an alley. Heavy now, at forty, the bite gone somewhat from his muscles. All of his superstitious tattoos unravel to a quiet place in the country. At this age, he's just started reading. There's the unlikely Leopardi, some Monica or Mona gave him for St. Valentine's. He tries Sylvia, though puts it aside when he reaches where my life was burning out. Isabella 
beside him puts out a thigh with its unfinishable sentence. He swallows his salve from the poet. Son of a bitch, why do they do that? Um, a room in Naples, 2005. Uh, Lo Spagnolo, um, the Spaniard, um, was Rafael Amato, who was a camarista, part of the Neapolitan crime gang, who was arrested in 2005. Um, <clears throat> Just a few more. So, next room is a room in the Pacific Palisades, 1979. Well, here's something. I never did like Tolstoy awful much, don't you know? Betty, Beverly, hell, I mean, Brenda. The old novelist was saying as he thumped the tablecloth, just missing the silver goblets and service plates steaming in drifts before him. Bald and small, he sat across from the young actress he wrote to habitually, praising in his endless beautiful trains and clauses that led often now to great tiredness. Against the one amber lampshade, they were profiled, a gray king and confidant. Where the sitting room dimmed at the periphery, Characters from his years abroad stepped out of dark freezes and spoke. A lush with remarkable tattoos, needled like varicose. An ancient legionnaire, the beautiful boy leading a wolfhound by the reins, and young Jean Genet, who, no, no, he'd not met Jean Genet. On Montmartre, he'd loved so many whores. In the young actress opposite, he sometimes saw them play across her features, an eyebrow arched back 50 years, the nose upturned or lengthened in the dark. A mole drew itself on her cheek. Therese, Sylvie, or Margot, was it, who sat with him now with a 50, 100, 1,000, who seemed to be there, leaning on an elbow, listening brightly, always just across from him in the other chair. Um, a Room in the Pacific Palisades, 1971. The writer is the novelist, Henry Miller. Just a, a couple more, I think, maybe three more. Two ones and a short one. Okay, so this is a, a room in Florence, 1266. More of a dog extended in all directions over the thin rug in the stone, in the stone wall cloister. The man begins to kick and whimper while his gut in good voice escapes his belt. The sleeping face is moist and flavorful, intensified by the little bursts of lightning in purples across his cheeks and nose. Mist, then a kind of softish light. Certain tropes of lyric poems pass into this scene where the friar, this Lodoringo, snores in deep chords, triumphantly out for all of his sermons and petitions. Marshes beyond the city walls thicken with low life and schismatic, but the friar is dreaming, vague transactions and soft flatteries on an ideal balcony. He has toothache in one molar, but his dream fills the space where the throb should be with a pale horse, clip clopping on cobbles. His head is full of hoofbeats as the horse trots through Florence without a rider or cause. Um, a room in Florence, 1266. Uh, Lodoringo delle Andalo, one of the profligate, jovial friars found among the hypocrites in the eighth circle of Dante's Inferno. <laughs> um, maybe just a few more, because I'm probably pushing my time limit.
Impeccably organized. Um, okay. A room at the Sasquatch Symposium, Montana, 1993. Raymond L. Wallace keeps his stumm, feels sadder than he has for ages. 1967 in his monkey suit, shambling out of focus and into the hungry tract of the American imagination. Um, Raymond L. Wallace, the Bigfoot hoaxer from Minnesota, Missouri. And one more. A room in the Republic, Capua, 73 BC. It's 40 degrees when the sun really means it, moving light columns through the dark ludus. Overhead, the white villa is empty. The menials, culinarians, gone, leaving walls glancing with lizards. A few mountain acanthus, petrified in their pots. The house treasures, looted or shattered through the corridors. Morning after morning, from the low foothills, daylight, a madness returning to a mind barely restored. Nihil semper restitui. Nothing will ever be restored. Inside the complex, barefoot, living on last pomegranates and dust, Domina watches petals blow through the baths. Um, a room in the Republic, Capua, 73 BC, the ludus is, is that of Lentulus Batiatus, ill-fated Dominus of Spartacus. <laughs> Thanks.